Cosmere can be a confusing place. From Alamancy to Surge Binding, there's a lot to look out for. We're your hosts and escorts to the realms. I'm Griff. And I'm Alex. And, and this, this is, is the Silverlight Silver Guide, Guide to the Cosmere. All right, and we're back. And we're going to talk about Secret Project 3. Yes. Are we going to say the title? or are We, we are. Do okay. I think, so after this whole year... Um, there was nothing like so I, I was mean, uh, I was spoiled for the title right and it did nothing to my experience that's fair and also at this point like if you're not if you're wanting to go in blind you should have been ordering these books when they were released yeah so yeah, at least title wise yeah i mean they've been on amazon right so Oh, I also recently on an advert saw the uh, cover for the, I don't know if I would assume the paperback edition of uh, Frugal Wizard's Handbook. Oh, yeah. So that was interesting. It's a, it's hardcover right now. Okay, it it's still hardcover, yeah. but it's the not the secret project right. cover. So yeah, that was that was interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's not anything impressive, but sure. it was interesting to sure. see. Yeah, the Trust of the Emerald Sea one is good too. Okay, I haven't seen that one yet. Yeah. Yeah, so... Okay, uh, we're going to talk about Yumi, Yumi and, the, and the Nightmare Painter. Yumi and the Nightmare Painter. Yes. Spoiler free for at least a little bit. Right. And, and then, then we'll go into yes. a deep dive into our spoilers. Yeah. Uh, it's going to get wild, I think. So, I believe so, yes. All right. So, first off, um, impressions. Spoiler free impressions. What do you got? Uh, I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say, I. Had some, I it was a very pick up, pick, put down book for me. Was it? But I think that was probably because of my own experiences in certain areas, not quality of the book. Okay. Although I will say that it was a little slow burn. It, it was very much a slow burn book. Huh. There's a big section in there where they are learning about each other's lives, mm. but not a whole lot is actually developing story wise. Sure. And it's not that I didn't enjoy those. Yeah. But yeah, I, it, it's Sanderson's first real romance. That's true. That is true. And so I think he's, you know, and, and it's not a genre he has a lot of experience in. I think we saw that with Mistborn and, uh, well, specifically Well of Ascension uh, with Zane. He is fairly good, in my opinion, of showing the relationships he chooses to show except that love triangle thing in Mistborn. Well, okay, here's also something I will say, though, yeah. is that I think he's good at pacing it around a fantasy novel. Yeah. I think he doesn't necessarily have the grasp yet of how to pace it as the main plot of a book. Hmm. And, you know, I'm not sure that he'll ever need to. No, no, I'm not saying he does yeah. need to. I'm just saying that I think that may be why this book suffered just a smidge yeah. I think, on the pacing front for me. Sure. I think he shows relationships really well. Oh, yeah. No, I absolutely Especially agree. in the Stormlight Archive. And one of the things that I really liked, without spoiling too much, is I really, really did like the way that uh, Yumi and... Um, the painter... Yeah, the painter's relationship developed because I felt it was very organic and very real and he he did not rush it. Yes. And yeah. I appreciated that. Like it wasn't just instantly saw each other and fell in love mm -hmm. or anything like that. Yeah. So that was yeah. really good. Yeah. So you listened to it. Yes, I did. Right? Yes. I listened to a little bit of it, but I mostly read it. Okay. Like actually read it. Right. And it only took me until the end of Sunday. So it came out, it released Saturday. Right. And I started reading it that morning. And then we went over to my in-laws and did stuff for most of the day. And I read on and off. And then I finished it Sunday. Right, right. And I didn't experience that much of a lull in the pacing. And I think it may be because I read much faster than the audiobook talks. That's also possible. Yeah. Um, yeah, that that's very possible. Uh, it's, 
Though I haven't necessarily had that issue with his other books. Mm. With with the two narrators. Um Kramer, the what's and Redding. Yeah. Michael Kramer and Michael Kramer. Kramer. There you go. Michael Kramer. That's what I was trying to remember. Um yeah, no, I haven't had that issue with their other with the like other book. Feeling slow? Yeah, like like in, unless it was intentionally so. Like if mm. you take Shalon's storyline, like that is intentionally slow to start because they're mm-hmm. trying to build up not only what's going on, but her own like plot, her her own kind of yeah secret plot underneath things. Sure. So like that's intentionally slow, but I didn't feel like you mean the Mi- nightmare painter was intended to be but it came off feeling slow, a little slow regardless. Yeah. But again, I also say that I have my own background issues with some of the themes in that book. And so therefore I think that was also probably part of it. Okay. So, gotcha. so it could have just been me, honestly, can, it, it might not be the book. Yeah. So. Let's see. Um, Heavily Asian inspired. Yes. And I enjoyed the fact that it was inspired, but he did not try to pull like like he did not try to be blatant about it 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 was done tastefully yes i mean you until i read the afterward where he delves into what his inspirations were i could see a sort of uh present day japan versus ancient japan yeah um, I will say I didn't necessarily, but again, I'm not also not very well versed on uh, Korean, Korean, right? Korean. Yeah, Korean culture. So I can't really necessarily speak on how much inspiration was there versus other South, you know, Southeastern yeah. uh, nations. Yeah. So, yeah. So he said Korean and Japan with Korean being Yumi's storyline. Right. And... Japan, Japan being painters. The painters. Yeah, painters right. storyline. Yeah. We'll go more into that after the after the spoiler alert. What would you what would you rate it? I would rate it probably probably an eight to an eight point five. I don't think I would recommend it to anybody. Like I don't think I would recommend it to everybody. I think I would definitely have to recommend it to somebody who was interested in Either Sanderson's writing specifically or mm, this would be a hard one to recommend, to be perfectly honest. I don't I don't actually necessarily think the rating system works well on that front because how well, much I personally enjoyed right. it. Just do how much consider, you enjoyed it. Right. How much I enjoyed it was probably an eight point five to a nine. Yeah. That's I'm I'm right there too. Yeah. Like I think it was well I think it was well done. I liked even though they well I liked the magic system. Yeah. Um, I think they were interesting. I think that they they didn't make me think as much as some of the other ones mm. have, though. No, and I don't think that's... I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, yeah. but I will say that the other ones have made me theorize or realize something, and I did not have that with this book. Yeah. And I'm kind of wondering if that colored my experience, because I think one of the great fun I do have with the Cosmere as a whole is seeing how the magic systems overlap. Like, like with Tress. Um, well, I don't know how spoilery we want to get with previous. Um, Let's say that for after the spoiler. Okay. Alert. Let me, let me put it this way in a very non spoilery way. Sure. I like seeing Tress's magic system and drawing the parallels with other things and mm-hmm. seeing how that connects. And then having Hoyd's explanation later on validate, Mm -hmm. that and i didn't get that with this book so much sure so all right um i'm not sure there's anything else we need to say that's non-spoilery other than i don't think so the artwork is amazing which i have not seen yet i need to download the art pack yeah Uh i would definitely if you are on the fence about getting the secret projects in their Kickstarter form, 
via Dragonsteel Books. Just do it. It's the art alone, I think, is worth it. And, you know, I've honestly kind of found that with a lot of his projects. Like, if you're going... I mean, this isn't to say don't get it if you weren't able to afford it or anything like that. But, like, if you have the means to get it in its in its Kickstarter form, do so. Because mm-hmm. the amount of stuff you get along with the book is going to very much validate what you're paying for. That's true. So, That's true. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going into spoilers. Spoilers. All right. Okay. So. Spoilers. Spoilers. Um, the magic systems were interesting, but not very dynamic. Yep. And I think that kind of, I think it hurt the story. It, it hurt the Sander Lanch a smidge. It. Yeah, it. So, we gotta we gotta define which parts we're talking about as the Sander Lanch. Okay, right. Which I'm assuming you're talking about the nightmares attacking. I'm drawing a blink on the city's name. Kilahito. Yes. So I'm assuming you're talking about the nightmares attacking Kilahito. And Yumi traveling to the machine. I am talking about before that, when, barely before that, when Nikaro, 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 and and Yumi find out what's been going on. Well, but well, Yumi, really, the painter does. Well, no, no, no. Hold on. I'm going to say that Yumi, honestly, is the one that discovers what's really going on because Nikaro never, I don't think until after the finale, doesn't really find out that there's a master machine. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, so when the reader finds out. Okay, Whoever. Yeah. Right, right, right. So that passage was confusing and it was obviously confusing because Hoyd goes into a whole bit the next chapter telling us exactly what happened to make it clear. Well, are we talking about okay, the Yumi's overseer Leun, right, being a nightmare. The, the stable nightmare that was attacked that was right. Right. Yes. When that happened, mhm. I thought that was very confusing. Oh, okay. I didn't actually find it so. Oh. Huh. So I I didn't like like Hoyt's explanation was helpful. Yes. To some extent, but I didn't find it particularly confusing to deal with. So I did not actually have that experience personally. Okay. Yeah. So. Well. Um, I thought it actually really nicely explained the point where she. So, so what I originally thought, uh, before we get that explanation was that I thought that the nightmares were in spirits in some way, mm-hmm. but corrupted right. somehow. Yes. Um, and that's why they recognize the stacking, Yumi stacking. Um, I will say that part was a little weak. Only because I don't know why Leon would recognize the stacking, but not Yumi herself. I thought it said that Leon was following Yumi specifically. Well, she was because of Yumi's energy, but uh, like she she dry like she she drives the nails her claws into Yumi and yes. starts sucking out the essence. Yeah. And then Yumi starts stacking, and that distracts Leon enough to mm. oh. stop her. And it was a little weird that the stacking distracted her, but Yumi herself did not. Mm. You see what I'm saying? I do. Yeah. Well, maybe we should take a step back. So we, we have... Two magic systems. Yes, sort yes, of that's going true. on. Uh, we have the magic system of uh, the painters who are able to 
influence the shape of the nightmares that enter into their city um, and uh, turn them into harmless shapes, which then apparently dissolve as far as I can tell. Yes. Uh, And so they, they paint to, to draw out that harmless image Mm -hmm. and then banish the nightmares. Yes. Um, And then we have Yumi who stacks stones Mm -hmm. in particular ways. Uh, usually like, and I've actually seen this in real life. Mm-hmm. Like I've, I've seen people that do this, this stone stacking that is really actually really impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, she stacks stones in particular ways to draw out spirits. Yes. Uh, from the ground. Yes. In um, particular, because the spirits like this, how, although in both cases, The magic stems from virtuosity being splintered in the system. Right. Which did I can't. Okay. Now answer a question for me because you might remember better than I do. Mm -hmm. Did Hoyt not say at the beginning that virtuosity self splintered? Yeah. Okay. So I was right about that. Yes. Okay. And that is if you listener, if you've been listening to us since last year, you'll know that I mentioned that I was spoiled for something. Right. Big. And that I couldn't tell anything about it because it itself would be spoiled. That is what I was spoiled on. Okay. Somebody in a Facebook comment said virtuosity splintered itself. Well, actually, they said virtue splintered themselves. Okay. So I think in the spoiler stream Sanderson had for the secret projects, he mentioned virtuosity and people thought it was virtue. Gotcha. But it's virtuosity, which specifically is artistic talent. Right. But I do find it interesting that one virtuosity splintered themselves, mm-hmm. whether it be a he or a she. I don't know if it actually specifies. Um, and I wonder why. Because obviously the spirits are aspects of virtuosity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is what Yumi is drawing with the with the stone stacking. And I think it... Hoyt said it was particularly a mix of logic and like, like pattern and right. organic and, and the humanity aspect of the art and everything like that. Though in that front, I'm, I'm a little bothered as to why painting wouldn't work. It did. It didn't draw any spirits though. Oh. Painting could, uh, quell the nightmares but you mean specifically very specifically they state in the story that painting will not draw spirits oh oops so right i mean it is what it is obviously sanderson's allowed to put his own rules on things so right i mean they like artistic draw or the historic dramas yeah which (laughs) yeah which was an interesting thing hilarious uh i do so the the was it Nihon lines? Hion. Hion lines. H I O N. Yes. I will say the dramas would probably bother the hell out of me considering that one character is always blue and the other one is always pink. Yeah. And that would bother the fuck out of me. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> to st- to take a step back, the Hion lines are one magenta and one cyan line. Uh, that are that run across cities mm-hmm. and are able to be used similarly to electricity. That's right. Uh, and so uh, I do find it interesting that they use magenta and cyan, though, because those are two of the three primary light colors. Mm-hmm. Uh, the light, co- the primary light colors are red, blue, green. Um, but red, blue, yellow. Nope. Okay. That's pigment, and uh, that's not even correct. So here's the thing. Light colors are red, blue, green. Mm-hmm. Those are the three primary light colors. Okay. Now those mix with um, red and blue. No. Red and yellow making magenta. Or no, red and green making magenta. Hold on. No, 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 no. I'm not correct. Red, blue, yellow. No, Our red, light. blue, green. Red, blue, green? Red, blue, green for light. I'm just going to look it up so 
our, our, our listeners don't doubt you. Just put in primary light colors. All right. Red, blue, green. Red, blue, green. Okay. Does it have the mixture of them? Red and green is yellow. There you go. Blue and yes. green is cyan. Blue and red is magenta. So those are the true primary pigment colors is cyan, magenta, and yellow. Mm. Yes, a lot of people say it is red, blue, yellow, but that is not actually correct. Oh, commonly simplified as red, yellow, and blue. Yes, but it's not actually correct. It's truly magenta, cyan, and yellow are the true primary pigment colors. So I find it interesting that Sanderson used two of the primary pigment colors for the Heon lines. Sure. I, it's not, I don't think it means anything, but I thought it was interesting. I actually started drawing the connection between the heel and lines and the spirits because they describe the spirits as almost like melting metal balls of red and blue light. Mm. So I did start drawing the connection there. I didn't quite see it going the way that it went, uh, but I did start drawing that connection pretty, pretty early on. Sure. That the spirits and the heel and lines were going to be connected somehow. Yeah. So... Yeah, and then so now that we have the magic system set up, the Sander Lanch with... So there was the small reveal that the planet that Painter saw in the sky was not Yumi's planet. Right, right. It, had, it was... It had four-armed inhabitants. It had Shodel on it. Shodel, and they primarily lived on boats. Yes. Which was interesting. And I find it interesting that even at the end of the book... Hoyt is still not sure why that planet shone through the shroud when nothing mm -hmm. else did. I am also still curious as to why that is the case. And it's also curious given that Hoyt specifically says uh, the Utah system. Yes, that Utah system that you've probably heard of before. Right, right. Like, and the reader like, hasn't, but whoever he's talking to has. Right. And so, yeah, I'm curious about that one as well, because I thought he was talking to the readers at first. And then I, I actually I stopped and I stopped the story and I Googled Utah system because I was like, yeah, have I heard of this before? Am I not remembering a name here? And then I looked it up. And I was like, no, no, I'm not miss, you know, forgetting a name this is not something we have talked about whatsoever so yeah. Yeah. i wonder if that is foreshadowing for the future it's foreshadowing for the future or whenever the story is explained as an in in book reference that character will that whoever is talking to will have just like come from utah or yeah possibly something I mean, will have happened I, I do hope we get an explanation for why virtuosity splintered itself. Yeah. Because that is a new experience we have never run into before. Yeah. But it did create something similar to Shades from Threnody. Yes, that's true. Well, mm. similar. And even, uh. come on, Hoyd, Hoyd mentions this is, Hoyd Alludes to Threnody. Well, yeah, no, I know he alludes to Threnody, but like the... the Cognitive it, shadows. Virtuosity created... That was the spirits, right? Yeah, they're cognitive shadows. Well, yes. Yeah. But like... How is it not like the shades? I guess I don't... I thought you were referring to the nightmares. I mean... But those were from the machine. The spirits were from virtuosity splintering. Mm -hmm. The nightmares were from the machine. And the shroud was from the machine. Maybe I read too fast. I think you might have. Because the machine ate the souls of the inhabitants of... I don't know if they ever actually named the planet. Kamashi. Kamashi. And 
while spirits cannot be created nor destroyed, they are like energy. It spat out the shroud as a byproduct. But because it had the souls of Komachi's residents, the only people it couldn't eat were the Yokihino? Yokihijo? Yokihijo. All right. Nightmares are a type of cognitive shadow native to Kamashi, which emerge from the shroud to feed on the minds of people when they sleep. They are formed by the souls of dead Kamashi people killed by the father machine and made into its servants. Yes. Gotcha. And the shroud was also created by the father machine. Yeah. So. The spirits, however, that Yumi calls are... Uh, splinters of virtuosity. Yes. Although I was confused about something. Okay. With that whole thing. So we know, we, we learn later that Yumi's whole existence is an illusion. Mm -hmm. She is living the same day over and over and over and over and over again. Mm hmm. And we know that the spirits are currently effectively like trapped by the father machine. Right. Like, like it gathered all the free spirits left. Mm hmm. So what the hell was Yumi calling with her stacking? Did it not let the spirits do their thing? inside the thing did it okay that might have been the explanation hmm so the spirits are called hijo yeah right okay right. bound to the father machine so And they also undulate to an inaudible rhythm, which I assume would be the rhythm of virtuosity. Probably. Yeah. So but like, like she's calling spirits. Yeah. But and the, they're behaving the way the spirits behave. Like yeah. she'll ask one to become a light and it'll become a light. Does it stop being a light when the day resets? Potentially. Does the father machine get it back at that point? Hmm. I'm assuming you're reading an article on how the, the spirits work. Sort of, yeah. Yeah, so this they're bound to the machine. Right. So I assume that it can just tell them to do whatever. Okay, that's fair. I don't know. It was a little confusing on that front. Yeah, because the, the original one that was like, help us, had to have... There's like a there's like a gray area where that's still sort of bound to the machine, but it still also has a little bit of sentience. Right, right, yeah. which is why it was able to bind... Uh, Yes. Nikaro and yeah. Yumi together. Yeah. So that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I did like it. I like the story. Um, I will say, I, I, I know we talked about this before, but I think I would have only made one change with the finale, which is instead of having Nikaro and Yumi's chapters be separate, he should have shucked that, that particular, uh, literary device mm -hmm. and instead split up their two chapters in between each other, making it almost kind of a montage bouncing back and forth right. between Yumi stacking and Nikaro painting against the nightmares. Yeah. Um, but other than that, no, I thought it was good. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. We saw a lot of other connections to the Cosmere. Mm -hmm. Big one being design. 
yes. who, who was in Tress of the Emerald Sea, and it was only one sentence. And because I was reading that some people were like, why was designed in this story and not in Tress of the Emerald Sea? Who was she in Tress of the Emerald Sea? Well, she wasn't. Um, Ulam says that Hoyd, the, the only monster on the ship was the one that they had trapped in one of the desk drawers. Oh, was that design? And oh, okay. Ulam gave her 12 faces or something like that. Gotcha. Like, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So, so, cause I, cause at that point I was just thinking that he had left design behind somehow or design died or whatever happens on Roshar. Right. No, no, no. Design was trapped in a drawer. Yes. <laughs> okay. Which is hilarious. It is hilarious. Yeah. Um, I get it though, because I think that if design had been free, um, the story would not have worked. No. Well, design would have seen the effects of, I think, uh, the Elantrian spell on Hoyd. Mm. So, because she is so well attuned to both the cognitive and the spiritual realm. Right. That I don't think the story would have worked. I, I think, see. I think she would have already known how to fix Hoyd. Yeah, probably. So. Yeah. Simple explanation. I do find it hilarious, though, that in both stories thus far that have been Cosmere stories, Hoyd has been completely out of commission for the story based it's on hilarious. magical shenanigans. It's amazing. <laughs> it's so, it's a brilliant, brilliant way of doing that. Oh, it absolutely is. And I am looking forward to seeing what happens in the third, because I believe that this is a pattern that is going to continue. Mm-hmm. I agree. Although I will say there is a lot of stuff that is left unexplained in, um, knew me and the nightmare King nightmare painter or nightmare parenting. So yeah, you mean the nightmare painter, uh, that I do want explanations for someday mm. because like, why was Hoyd able to see through Leon and Yumi and Nikaro? It's a good question. Because he even says that he doesn't have an explanation for it. Like yeah. he knows what's happening, but he doesn't know why. And then he also got more in, uh, specific details from Masaka afterwards. Right. So, yeah. That's... I, I found, ooh, I found Masaka's character really interesting. Or her species, I should say, the Hordling. Oh, yeah. The the Sleepless? Right. Right, right, right. Right, right, yeah, Yes. And so I'm, well, I'm, okay, let me rephrase that. I wasn't interested to see them in general, but I was interested to see them in a non-creepy fashion because like, yeah, she's just kind of normal. She's not like the sleepless on Roshar that are the right now really cryptic and, and enigmatic. Oh, come on. Nick on in, in the Dawn Shard was whatever his name was. Okay. Yeah. He wasn't that creepy, but like still they've been kind of mysterious in these background figures thus far, because like when we see them first in Roshar, we're like, what the fuck is happening? Who else would, who else would write the backs of the Stormlight archive? Nobody. I know, but still, I just, I found it interesting to see a, a it's very entertaining list that was just like, yeah, I'm just kind of here. I did appreciate the fact that she named herself as the 60th horde of whichever, That was cool. I did like the fact, though, that she didn't actually name herself that. Design named her that. She Uh, said she preferred the name Masaka. That's true. So I actually like... Okay, one of the things that I will say that I liked quite a bit, and I know that it was very blatant, and I appreciate it anyway, was the amount of um, necessity Hoyd places on consent. Hmm. In the beginning of the book. And I really appreciated that. Yeah. Like, it's not something that authors do enough, in my opinion. That's fair. And I think that that was that was really good. I agree. Um, Painters, realistic. Showing of depression. Oh, really? You thought it was depression? Uh, I, I mean, at least in some part. 
Sort of, yeah. Like a like a like a low key. Interesting. It read more as anxiety to me. Definitely. There's. I feel or, like. Oh, okay, you mean like with the apartment? The apartment. Oh, okay. And, okay. Yeah. No. I, I'll I'll get behind that. Yeah. 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 yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and that came from the. Sorry, anxiety. I thought you I, know, you're good. My my brain immediately jumped to what he had done to his friends right. back in the past. No, that's super anxiety for sure. Okay, no, no, no. And yeah, if you're talking about yeah, no, if you're talking really, about present day, yeah, no, I'll agree. Yeah, yeah. definitely depression. Yeah, yeah. Um, without it being maniacal or blown so, out of proportion, which we know Sanderson is good at. Right. Well, and one of the things I appreciated about his depression was that he still got up and went to work every mm-hmm. day. And that is something that I don't think, because if you ever see depression in media most of the time, it is so debilitating. They're like stuck in bed. They mm-hmm. never get out of bed. They never do anything. And it's like... Which is valid. Which is valid, yes. I'm not saying that people don't experience that kind of depression. But I know that when I had depression, I still did get up. Mm-hmm. I went to work every day. I right. got my, you know, I, I paid the bills. I paid what I needed to. I just was in bed pretty much every other point of the day than that Mm -hmm. um so i did appreciate that representation of like yeah not all of people not all the people who have depression are so obvious because if you're just looking for the people who are so debilitated that they are not even able to live life you're going to miss the people that are suffering that Mm -hmm. are able to still go through those motions yeah yeah that was really good We have other cosmic connections. The and some that we don't even know about yet, such as the Iron Seven way station. Right. Which if that's not Skadrial I mean, yeah, Skadrian, it's definitely Skadrian like in some way. I, I absolutely think it is. I think I think at the point that Hoyt is telling the story, as I said, I think this goes back along with Tress of the Emerald Sea and Sixth of the D- Sixth of the Dusk, but where within I also said ambiguosity. Uh, I know that, that is not actually the word. The word is actually ambiguousness. Mm. I don't appreciate that. I I made up a new word okay. and I, because I like the word. I like the sound of a- ambiguosity better. Okay, that's fine. Um, but anyway, uh, so I yes, there there is a a vast cloud of ambiguity around. Um. No, I didn't use ambiguosity. What did I say? Amorphous? Yes. Amorphosity? A- amorphosity. That's the word that I like better. I see. Uh, because ambiguity is the noun. I actually uh, had to look up that word because when I read it, I was like, <laughs> listener, he sent it to me in a text and I was like, I make up words too, but usually not this long. Yes. No, a- amorphousness is the actual yeah. word and I still like amorphosity better. Yeah. Uh, anyway, regardless, there is an ambiguity around um, where those three line up specifically. And yeah, like and they they are all post space. Yeah, they're they're all post space travel. I would say, however, in my opinion, and this is just my own, like my own brain, I would say that. Um, you mean the nightmare pantry come first? Tress comes second, and sixth of the dusk is still at the end. I mean, that's as good a guess as right. any. That's the, the reason. Okay, the reason I place those in in those realms are they're tiny, tiny little little pieces of evidence. Okay. Hoyd talks about a three year check in or something mm-hmm. like that. And I feel like with sufficiently advanced space travel, they would not have to wait three years for a ship to get there. All right. So I feel like space travel exists, but is still not quite as advanced as advanced as in some of the others. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tress. I don't know why I put that where I put that, except for the fact that the only space travel we see is the Elantrian. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Elantrians had space travel probably before anybody. 
So I feel like that could still be pretty early in the... I could honestly see putting it before Yumi and the Night Painter, to be perfectly honest. I could see either of those swapping places. Sixth of the Dusk, they have technology so advanced that they can literally jumpstart other civilizations by dropping some of their equipment on the cultures. And so I feel like they not only have to have sufficiently advanced technology, you know, Clark's, Clark's Law? Yeah, Clark's Law. Are you familiar with Clark's Law? Uh, yeah, sufficiently advanced technology, technology will look like... Indistinguishable it, from, from magic, magic yeah. yes. So, I mean, they have such advanced technology that they can literally jumpstart other civilizations by dropping a single piece and, like, letting them figure it out. So I feel like it not only has to be super advanced, but also super simple. Simple enough that... that other cultures can pick it up fairly easily. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that is probably at the very far end of the spectrum. That's fair. That's um, just me. Yeah. And then a lot of people think that Hoyt is telling the story of Tress and the Emerald Sea to Six of the Dusk. Oh, interesting. Mainly because that's the only world we've seen that has had a main character that has a bunch of water on it. And at the beginning of Tress, he goes, there was a girl living on a rock in the sea, but not like a sea that you've seen. Something like that. It's a stretch. It's a little bit of a stretch because we have seen oceans in Skadriel. And Roshar. And in Roshar, yeah. Like, like both of them are, are pretty big candidates on that front. Yeah, I'm, I'm not buying it. Maybe there's other things. Maybe. I mean, if somebody provides me with more evidence, maybe. But the, the body of water thing is not... No, that's not selling it for me. Yeah. Um, we have Maypon sticks from Cell. Yes. Which makes... Well, okay, so... And that, that brings up an interesting thing in a general sense. And this is this is something that kind of spreads throughout the Cosmere as a whole. This mm -hmm. is not just this story specifically is the spread of humans mm -hmm. and how they get from planet to planet. Right. Because they are on every planet that we've visited so far, uh, except maybe Shodell, but no, even then, even then, I mean like the, the visitors are right. humans. And so I just kind of wonder how did humans become so ubiquitous? Uh, the main answer is that whatever God landed on that planet made them in their likeness. Right. But didn't we have some shards that were dragons? Yes. And Shodel? Yes. So does that mean that those shards would have created Shodel and dragon? I imagine it. Dragons to, on there. I imagine to create actual dragons, you can't just... Whoosh, Here's, invest here's investiture. So then why are humans? Probably because you don't have to invest them. Well, do you, you don't necessarily have to invest dragons either. Well, we don't know that. Oh, okay, well, let me say this. The form of a dragon. Yeah. Of a, of a large... Yes, I mean, the it, form of a dragon. Okay, yeah, but even yeah. cultivation masquerades as a human-ish thing. Right. And so why? Like, that, that's, that's my question. To the fact that she's a dragon... Okay, but why? She didn't. Make, but she didn't make the humans on Roshar. No, I'm not saying she made the humans I know, on Roshar. But that kind of like, I see what you're saying, but also it's not applicable because the only shard that was a dragon is living on a world that doesn't have, that already had humans. So right. So the one example we could have seen from that. So let's go with the Shodel one. Okay, so the Shodel one potentially maybe the planet that was able to be seen through the shards through the shroud yeah was virtuosity a shodel i don't think so i think there were only two and one of them was ambition i don't know let's see let's see what the copper mind has for us thank you copper mind <laughs> yeah uli da was the vessel of the shard ambition and then We've seen Jan Ven or Jan Ven at the end of the Lost Metal. Um, okay, so 
as far as we know, only one was a vessel of a shard. And, and that was, was Ambition. Yeah, and they were splintered. Right. Because Ambition was Threnody, right? Yeah. So why does Threnody have humans then? Well... I don't know. I don't know either. I just, like... Uh, <sighs> I'm not as stressed about it as I sound. Like... Okay. Obviously, one of the reasons why we have humans on all of these stories is because it allows humans to relate to... Yes. That's accurate. But, uh, like, but that's a doyless answer. I'm looking for the Watsonian answer. Sure. There's... So, I mean, the spread of humans is in three ways. Right. The shards make them on right. that planet. Yes. They come through Shadesmar. Right. They come through space. Right. Yes. And we know that, obviously, humans ended up on Roshar through Shadesmar. Adelnasium made humans on Ashen. Right, on Ashen. And then they came to Roshar through Shadesmar. You're right. Yes. Yes. That, right. that was... Yes. Yes. So he made Parshendi on Roshar. Roshar, yeah. Those, yeah. those, those were the so Adelnasium Parshendi. No, but I don't think he needed to be because Adonalsium is Parshendi. a fusion of all of the shards. Yeah, that's fair. He was he was a being of his own. Right. He was not a being that eventually gained the power. Right. So that's that's my answer on that front. Now, is there something to be said for the uh, Parshendi having gem hearts the same the way that the Chul Chols do and that everything on Roshar tends to be gem focused? Yeah, actually, there's probably something to that. And Adonosium's nature. But at the moment, right. we don't have enough information to say what exactly that is. Um, as I said, I know the Doyleist answer. I do know the Doyleist answer for why. But I want a Watsonian one as well. That's fair. I will say that travel through Shadesmar is probably the most likely way that whether it be accidental or intentional. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that people can unintentionally. The Ariali might take slaves and then drop them off at different planets. That's true. And the Ariali are Elantrian. No, they're just Ariali. Wait, the Eri oh, the Eriol, not the Irie, not the Irie. Never mind. Not the yeah, Irie yeah. could take people as prisoners <laughs> and drop them off. You're not wrong. <laughs> I mean, yes, but no, that was that was who I was thinking of, not the Eriali. Um. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, I think Yumi was good. I liked Yumi and the Nightmare Painter. I thought it was a good story. Yeah. As I said, I think that the pacing was a little weird, partly because personal. Partly because I think that Sanderson is still getting his legs when writing pure romance. Yeah, I mean, doubt it'll ever actually be pure romance, but... No, but this was as close as we've gotten yeah. so far. and it was nice. Oh, yeah, no, it was. It was not a bad story whatsoever. I think that his he has already gotten his chops for writing romance subplots. Mm -hmm. He just made it more of a plot this time. Yeah. So... But yeah, I don't know if there's anything else to say. No, other than um, the fact that they told us to bundle up with some ramen in the email they sent right before they released Yumi spoiled a little bit of the, <laughs> the book. I mean, I guess. It Not kinda, really. I mean, it, it, it's about as spoilery as the, as the title. Right. Honestly. Yeah. Like you read Yumi and the Nightmare Painter. I was and... about to spoil the fourth title just right here, just oh. absentmindedly. It's <laughs> so like... It's really not like my mind just had more time to get hyped about what you, me and the nightmare painter meant. Right. Right. Yeah. I did. I will say that I kind of liked the painting aspect, even though it wasn't very dynamic. I did like yeah. that aspect yeah. of the, of the magic system. So it was really cool. Yeah. Okay. But I think that's it. Yep. I don't think we have anything else to say. I don't think so. 
I will say that I found it interesting that virtuosity spirits could become pretty much anything. That was cool. Yeah, I think there's something there. I don't know what yet. They're like Fabrials. Yeah, kind of. but could could they become shard blades? Probably. That'd be an interesting to see. Yeah. I mean, he sort of had a paintbrush shard blade. Nikato? Right, but that was from his own soul. That wasn't from the spirits. Yeah. But still, I mean, invested with virtuosity's investiture. Yeah. Know. Yeah, so probably. Interesting. It was interesting. Anyway, uh, until next time, don't panic, world hoppers. Life before death. Strength before weakness, and ramen before destination. Very important. The music you hear is part three, The Spirit, from Zavadilla's The Music of Elantris, produced by B-Roll Records. Available now on Apple Music, Spotify, and most music providers. If you like what you hear, and you want others to hear it as well, please leave a rate and review. It really helps us get more listeners. 